Hello and welcome to my dungeon, which is fitting because today I'm going to talk about dungeon design. And I don't mean a fast and easy work-saving method to prepare a last-minute dungeon the day before the game. If you're looking for that, just do a five-minute dungeon and call it a day. No, I am talking about a masterclass in dungeon design. How to create a dungeon that is immersive, challenging and fun to crawl through. What I'm going to present in this video is the condensed experience of two decades of dungeon mastering and weeks of extensive research into the topic. It doesn't cover the topic in its entirety. And that would be impossible. For dungeon design is a vast subject and for every practice that I will present here, there are exceptions where they do not apply. And that's well and good, because dungeon design is an art form. And as any art form, it lives of its variety and different interpretations. So, to be honest, this video is just my interpretation of dungeon design and not the be-all, end-all of all dungeon design. There are three main design aspects one has to keep in mind when designing a dungeon. Immersion, challenge and fun. Immersion, in this context, is how believable the dungeon is within the context of the game. Does it feel like a real place that could exist in the game world? Does it have internal logic? Or is it just a random collection of rooms, traps and enemies? Challenge is how much effort the players have to put into reaching their goal in the dungeon. Not the characters, but the players. And since we play a TTRPG, this takes the form of intellectual challenges. Every challenge in the dungeon, be it an obstacle, a trap, a puzzle or a combat encounter, should challenge the problem-solving skills of the players. Fun, you could say, is the end goal of dungeon design. It is hard to quantify, but it is always something you should keep in mind. It is nice to have a super believable dungeon with a complex ecosystem, but does all of this detail actually make it more fun? It is easy to create a gauntlet of deadly traps and nigh impossible combat encounters but is that actually fun to play? But what actually is a dungeon? What am I talking about? In the context of a tabletop RPG, a dungeon is any limited space that can be structured into corridors and rooms. This might take the form of a typical underground dungeon, but it could also be a castle, a mansion, a maze of city streets, sewers, a cave system, a swamp, or a stretch of dense forest, and so on. To create immersion, there are two aspects you have to keep in mind. The believability and the storytelling. They work together hand in hand to create the immersion. Believability. For the immersion, it is important that the dungeon appears as if it could realistically exist within the game world. The dungeon must be inhabited by creatures that could believably be encountered there. Ask yourself, why are these creatures there? When did they get there? And how do they live there? Why? Maybe they moved in there of their own accord. Why? For shelter? resources or power. These are typically the three reasons to move anywhere. Perhaps the inhabitants also built the place. Why? For shelter, resources or power. Or maybe the inhabitants have been captured and forced into the dungeon. Why? As a workforce, laborers, entertainment, guard dogs, hostages, livestock sacrifices, there are many options. 
When did they get there? Did they build the place? Then the dungeon's architecture reflects the engineering means of the culture of the inhabitants. Or did they just move in? Then the dungeon's architecture reflects someone else's engineering means and culture, or it's a natural place. The new inhabitants will have modified the place, though. More on that later. Or maybe the current inhabitants are only guests. Then the dungeon's architecture will reflect someone else's engineering means and culture, and the current inhabitants will not have modified it. If the inhabitants moved in a long time ago, then that was a lot of time for things to break, to be repaired, to be altered and expanded. If they moved in just recently, then either the place is new and has just been built, or if the place is old, then they didn't have a lot of time to modify it, so there will be only superficial and easy to construct modifications such as wooden constructions and furniture. How do they live there? The key to making a dungeon immersive is to make it believable that the creatures you encounter in it actually live in the place and are not just movable objects. There are a few aspects of living in a place you should consider in order of importance. C. Especially in underground dungeons, how do they see? How do they light the place? Do they light the place? With what? How much of it? At what times? Maybe they have just handheld candles that only light the immediate area when needed. Or torches that maybe burn for about an hour. Or they use lamps that burn for hours. And even then there is the option that the lamps are stationary or that they only carry the lamps with them, only lighting the spaces that are currently in use. There might be bioluminescent fungi that produce light, but you can only see that when there are no other light sources. And of course there might be windows, shafts and even mirror systems to make use of sunlight. There might be alchemical light sources that shine for hours without producing any heat, or even magic crystals and lamps that constantly emit light. Sleep. Every creature needs a place to take shelter and rest. That might just be a corner in a room, a cage, a lair, barracks, or a luxurious bedchamber. Eat. Every creature requires air, water and food. Do they get it in the dungeons? Are there fields and gardens, livestock, wells, ventilation shafts or wilderness to gather and hunt in? Or do they get it from outside the dungeon and only store it? Then all of the aforementioned stuff should be outside of the dungeon. How do they transport the stuff into the dungeon? Where and how do they store it? Waste. What kind of waste do the inhabitants produce? Trash? Manure? Do they dispose the trash inside of the dungeon? Or do they dispose of the trash outside the dungeon? How often do they leave to do so? Or do they even have a system like a trash chute or a sewer system to dispose the waste? Those might be used as entrances into the dungeon. And where does all of that stuff go outside of the dungeon? Are there trash heaps, pits or pools of sewage outside of it? Reproduce. That's only necessary for long-term habitation of the dungeon. Do they reproduce in the dungeon? Where do they find partners? If required, where do they raise their young? If not required, where could the young be encountered? Or do the creatures reproduce outside of the dungeon? Then at some point they would have to leave the dungeon to reproduce. Or do they not reproduce inside of the dungeon and only wander into the dungeon from the outside? You don't need to plan a completely realistic ecosystem.
and exactly calculate the amount of food and agricultural space and so on. Just keep in mind that it should be there and roughly estimate how much there should be. Don't get bogged down with every little detail. Storytelling. Every place and character has a story. Speaking of story, this video is sponsored by me. I just released an omnibus of the first three Sword and Sorcery or arguably Sword and Planet fantasy stories that I wrote and released in 2020. This volume collects the first three stories and also contains a fourth never before released short story called Motor Scourge. If you're interested in fantasy and sword and sorcery, check out my work in the link in the description below, available on Amazon for Kindle and print on demand. Thank you, let's continue the show. For a dungeon, there are three important questions you should answer. Who built the place? Why? And when? Who? The architecture of the place will reflect whoever built it their means of construction and style. Or it might be a natural place. Then how did that natural place form? Why? Why was the place constructed? What is the place's purpose? Is it a shelter, a home, fortification, a temple, a tomb, just storage or a prison or any other reason? The purpose will reflect what kind of rooms you will find inside the dungeon, and the general layout and size. Shelter. A shelter is a place to live for a short amount of time. It is usually small, has a straightforward layout and a few rooms to live in. Home. A home is like a shelter, but bigger, more elaborate and built for long time habitation. So it will be more comfortable and it might include agriculture and other aspects of how do they live there. A fortification will be hard for enemies to get into. It will include locked doors, gates, traps and a gauntlet design with many opportunities to ambush and fight off attackers. Often a fortification will include living quarters for the garrison and these quarters in themselves will be a shelter or a home. Fortification might also have side gates to launch sorties outside of the dungeon, and it might have hidden escape tunnels for the garrison or important persons to get away. A temple is mainly constructed to venerate a god or gods, so there will be rooms of veneration and communion. There will be holy sites and holy artifacts. A temple might include living quarters for the priests serving the place. And these living quarters will be in and of themselves a home. A tomb will have a labyrinthian design to hinder and confuse intruders. It will have traps to kill intruders and secret doors and passages. There will be no living quarters. There will be no concessions to the living at all. Though a tomb might include symbolic versions of homes, fortifications and temples, but these are only decorative and don't need to be functional. A storage, a cellar for example, will have a simple layout with no living quarters, no fortification and no traps. It might be huge and sprawling though. A prison is a mixture of a home and a fortification, with the objective of keeping the prisoners from escaping. It will include extra rooms for the guards who might not live there, but might be garrisoned there. And of course, any place might have been modified to serve a different purpose by its current inhabitants. A storage cellar, for example, might become a shelter or a tomb might be repurposed as a fortification. When was the place constructed? Is it still under construction? Then there will be rooms missing, 
and there will be construction going on. And the construction workers will have to live somewhere, and the construction tools and material will have to be stored somewhere. It may have been built recently. Then the structure will only have one style, that of its builders, and everything will be new and shiny. Or it might have been built some time ago. Then the dungeon will show signs of wear and tear. Parts of it might be broken. But if the structure is inhabited by cultural beings, then parts of it will be repaired and maintained. If the dungeon was built a long time ago, then the structure might show several periods of habitation, of inhabitants abandoning the sites and of new inhabitants moving in. This might reflect in different styles of construction layered on top of each other. The dungeon might have undergone extensive repairs and refurbishments. Especially fortifications and homes are often expanded over time. The old parts might form the core of the new structure, or the expansion might be so vast that the old parts are only a minor part of the new structure. Once again, if the different parts have been built in different periods of habitation, they might reflect different methods and styles of construction. Some parts of the structure might even be replaced completely. And a very old dungeon might also have vast areas that are in bad repair, maybe even collapsed and inaccessible, especially if the structure has not been inhabited by civilized folk or kept it maintained. So, there's a story of the construction. Who built it? Why did they build it? When did they build it? Where did they build it? Then there's a story of the current inhabitants of the dungeon. When did they move in? Why did they move in? And how did they change the place why they lived in there? Then there is a story that will happen when your players enter the place and interact with it. And then there will be a story when the party leaves. What do they take out of the dungeon to bring it into the game world? And how will their actions in the dungeon have changed the place? Will it now be forgotten? Or what will the surviving residents do with the place? Or who or what will move in? Challenge. There are several types of different challenges you can put into a dungeon. Challenges of navigation, obstacles, and encounters. Navigation. The bigger the dungeon, the more complex the layout, the harder it is just to find one's way. This becomes even more of a challenge if strict time records are kept, torches and other supplies run out, and the party comes across random encounters. Not getting lost and finding the optimal route when backtracking becomes essential. It is good and all to leave chalk markers at every intersection so that you will find your way back, but drawing a map and gaining an understanding of the dungeon's layout is better. It allows you to find alternative routes and makes finding secret rooms easier. Several interconnected levels and routes that pass underneath each other make for a more complex dungeon layout. Use a main route through the dungeon, the biggest route, the direct route, the obvious route. This forms a sort of highway through the dungeon. Once it is cleared, it can be used to quickly traverse through the sections of the level. Use side routes as both an alternative to the main route and to expand the dungeon. These routes should eventually loop back on themselves or the main route. Side routes provide alternative routes to get past certain challenges, whatever they may be. But the alternative route should also provide a challenge, if possible a different kind of challenge. By interweaving several main routes and loops, stacking them on top of each other, the level becomes complex.
Because of the loops that eventually lead back to the main route, it is hard to get lost. The challenge is to find the fastest route to backtrack through the dungeon. Use routes that spiral around vertical accesses, such as ladders, stairs or elevators, to make backtracking easier. Use one-way valves such as drops, collapsed bridges, slides, magic mirrors or rotating doors to restrict backtracking and force PCs to forge ahead. Use hidden paths such as bridges, tunnels or secret doors that are hard to spot on the way in but easy to spot on the way out to make backtracking easier. Obstacles There are four main types of obstacles that will get in your way when exploring a dungeon. Environmental, traps, puzzles and monsters. Environmental obstacles are features of the environment that make it hard to traverse. Rocky, difficult terrain, gorges, tall walls, partially collapsed corridors, flooded sections, lava, fire, plant growth, fortifications and so on. They can often be solved and overcome by having the right equipment, climbing gear or shovel for example. In that case, it is a matter of how much time is spent while traversing them. An obstacle might be spiced up with an encounter that makes use of the environment. Sometimes they can only be passed one way easily, like a steep slope or drop working as a one-way valve. If the right equipment is not available, or if the group is unwilling to invest the time, then there should be an alternative route through the dungeon to circumvent these obstacles. Traps. I will make an entire video just on this topic alone. Like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see that. For now, let me stick to the basics. Use proper foreshadowing to warn the group of the existence of traps. That might take the form of a sprung trap of the same kind, perhaps with the remains of the last victim, or the absence of any other feature in a corridor or room might indicate that they are actually traps. There might also be holes in walls, uneven floors, gaps between stones, all of that might indicate traps. Traps should be a kind of puzzle, not something to be solved by a roll or just dealing damage. Do not require perception checks to spot traps. Ask the players what they are looking for. What are they doing to spot the traps? Just taking damage because you failed a perception check is no fun. The challenge should be how can I spot and circumvent or disarm the trap? Encourage the players to come up with creative solutions. A 10-foot pole is often useful to trigger traps from safe distance. An encounter in a trapped room may add extra challenge. If the right solution is not available or if the group is unwilling to invest the time, then there should be alternative routes through the dungeon to circumvent these obstacles. A note about storytelling. The traps should feasibly have been constructed by the builders of the dungeon. Also, traps will fall into disrepair if they are not maintained. Some traps might even require to be manned. Puzzles. You can think of environmental obstacles, traps and even combat encounters like puzzles. Something that can be solved by clever thinking. Puzzles that are puzzles for their own sake often make no sense within the story of a dungeon and can be detrimental to immersion. If you really want to do puzzles as a main attraction, wizard towers and forgotten temples lend themselves as a suitable location. The puzzles are eccentricities of the builders or deliberate challenges to test whoever comes into the dungeon.
There might be special items that give magic abilities only within the dungeon and are used to solve puzzles within the dungeon, be it environmental obstacles or traps. Examples. Magnetic boots that let you walk on iron walls, unmovable rods, mirrors, old school diving suit with hand cranked air pump, or a ring that lets you switch places with your shadow. Classic Zelda games are a great inspiration for these. Monsters. Monsters don't need to be a combat encounter. They can be obstacles. The challenge then becomes how to get around them. What senses does the monster have? Which of them are good? Which of them are bad? Can it be distracted? By what? Is it stationary? Or does it move through parts of the dungeon? Which parts? How fast? Encounters. There are three main types of encounters. Social, stealth and combat. Any encounter can be social. Not everything will attack the PCs on site. You can typically communicate with every creature capable of speech. Every creature should have motivation, a secret and a dilemma. This opens possibilities for roleplay and diplomacy. You can often even communicate with creatures incapable of speech, like animals. Even animals have something they want, something they like, something they hate, something they fear. I mean, have you ever tried getting your dog to do something specific? There are also spells and other magic means to make this communication easy. Depending on the motivation, alliances and the actions of the PCs, diplomacy might be impossible. Use the reaction table if you are in doubt how an NPC should react to the PCs. Stealth. Here the challenge is to get around the encounter without being spotted. Sneak around, hide in the shadows, use distractions and so on. Ask yourself, how can the PCs be spotted? Do the guards need light? Do they have spotlights? Did they set alarm traps? Can they run somewhere to sound an alarm? Guards can be circumvented, distracted, lured away and taken out. Guards can be stationary or follow a patrol pattern. Patrolling guards might stumble across tracks of the PCs, like the bodies of other guards. Don't let the PCs fail the entire stealth section because of one failed role. Use group checks or allow them a way to recover from a failed stealth check. They might have to take out the guard that spotted them before they can raise the alarm, for example. Combat. Don't use balanced combat encounters. The first challenge is for the party to decide if they have a chance in a fight at all. But make the danger of any encounter clear from the description. Use foreshadowing to make combat avoidable. Give the party a chance to escape if they find themselves losing combat. Combat can also be a puzzle. What tactics can the party use to give them the advantage? Stealth, ambush, formation? Does the monster have any strength that the party could mitigate? Fiery breath, poison, can it see in the dark? Does the monster have any weaknesses that the party can exploit? Is it death, weak to a certain form of attack, an element or poison? Are there NPCs or other monsters in the dungeon that could help the party by diplomacy, by just luring them near the combat encounter? The solution to this combat puzzle should be found somewhere in the dungeon. Like, if the monster has weakened to a specific plant, that plant should be found somewhere in the dungeon. But it is okay if this solution can also be found outside of the dungeon. So if the party encounters that monster, they can go outside of the dungeon, prepare with the knowledge they have gained, and come back with the necessary combat advantage. Let enemies make use of the environment of obstacles and traps and ambush locations 
to give them the edge in combat. Place guards in advantageous positions, give them weapons and equipment that make use of the environment, like crossbows or climbing claws, or squalls of water walking. The puzzle challenge here becomes how to mitigate the combat advantage of these enemies, or to even turn it around. Good for example, push an enemy into one of his own traps. Fun. Always keep fun in mind when working on the other aspects of the dungeon. Give the party enough information to make informed decisions. But don't bore them with too much information. Don't hide important information from the party. Don't try to deceive or trick them, unless that would be more fun for them. Don't use a confusing layout just to confuse the players. A corridor does not become more interesting just because it's winding around 27 corners. Give each corridor and room an identity, a theme, something that sets them apart from the rest of the dungeon. Use story to give each part of the dungeon a purpose. Use loops instead of dead ends. And if you use dead ends, make them short and place a reward at the end. Use foreshadowing. This might be one of the most important lessons in here. Use all senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, temperature and smell. Foreshadow where a tunnel leads, especially at intersections, so the party can make an informed decision which tunnel they should follow. Just tossing a coin is no fun. Warn of traps. Warn of encounters and monsters. Give alternative to challenges. Alternative route, alternative solution, alternative challenges. Make backtracking easy. See navigation for ideas unless it's more fun to force the party to go ahead. Put safe rooms into the dungeon without any challenge or encounter. The party can use these to rest. Use these between hard challenges to space the tension. Put a bit of story in these rooms to make them interesting though. Be mindful of the challenge the dungeon presents. This time the challenge for the characters, not the players especially the deadliness of traps and the power of monsters. Those will depend heavily on the PC's level, however. A typical challenge would be if the party can easily defeat the weakest monster, loses HP and spells at normal monsters, and almost dies when encountering hard monsters, and they have to avoid the hardest monsters. A low-level party has only little resources and magic, pass obstacles, traps, and solve puzzles. A high-level party, on the other hand, has much equipment and magic to solve puzzles, and also many hit points and magic to absorb damage from traps. Traps that have other effects than damage scale better to different levels. Such effects could be the time lost by getting out of the track, debilitating poison or curses, and of course, instant death. Feel free to change the challenge around for a different feel to the game. If you go into a horror direction, for example, the dungeon can be much more deadly. If you build a funnel or a gauntlet, then the formula changes. The weakest monster becomes the normal monster, and the normal monster become hard. All other monsters should be avoided. It is also okay for traps to be deadly, with little foreshadowing. Finding out how 90% of the PCs die is part of the fun of a funnel. And a normal dungeon for a level 1 to 3 party can become a gauntlet for a level 0 party. How to come up with a dungeon layout. There are methods of throwing a number of dice on a sheet of graph paper. The position of the die becomes the position of the room, and the number indicates the size of the room. Use a mix of different dice for more varied results. There are also random generators. Donjon RPG Tools has a very good one, for example. Since I come from a storytelling background, I like to start with the story of the dungeon. 
The background and the story of the dungeon will inform many details about its layout, its size, architecture, the size and type of rooms that should be inside the dungeon. Worlds without numbers and forbidden lands have great random tables to come up with the story for a dungeon. And here is the method that I have come up with myself. I call it the root first method. You start by drawing a rune or letter. This will form the highways through the dungeon and the main entrances. The more complex the rune, the more complex the overall layout will become. Next, draw circles overlapping the rune and each other. This will form the looping roots through the dungeon. Mix up the size, placement and overlap of these circles to create varied layouts. Up until this point, it is super fast to iterate a few designs. Draw several and we have something that looks interesting. Once you have that, draw squares at intersections. If the intersections look like a mess, just draw a big square around it. The squares become the rooms. You can draw squares at empty looking points on the loops as well. The endpoints of the rune might also become dead ends instead of entrances. Then simplify the design. Combine redundant tunnels and scratch out unnecessary parts. This gives you the overall layout of the dungeon. Now it's time to fill it out. Give each room a purpose fitting the story of the dungeon. Add doors, secret doors, one-way doors and additional entrances where they fit the story. Keep in mind, entrances might drop from above or below into rooms and they might connect to other levels of the dungeon. There are three main perspectives to draw the map in, depending on the type of dungeon. Top-down view. Use this when the dungeon is mostly sprawling out in a horizontal plane. You can make use of several levels to add verticality to the whole dungeon. Side view. Use this when a dungeon is mostly sprawling out vertically. You can use both side view to map out the general layout of the dungeon and the top-down view to map out each level. Isometric view is a combination of the two and lends itself when the dungeon has limited sprawl both horizontally and vertically. This way you can use a single map to show the entire dungeon. No matter what perspective you take, there's only so much complexity you can put into the map depending on the size and scale of the map. Huge dungeons need to be sections into several maps to keep track of the layout. Maybe one overview map and several detail maps. After deciding on the layout, take some graph paper and start drawing the rooms, starting with the biggest and most important rooms. There's special isometric graph paper that helps to draw in that perspective. After placing all the rooms, draw in the corridors connecting them. Fill in obstacles, doors, traps, furniture, decoration, treasure and so on. Then place the encounters. Keep in mind that inhabitants of the dungeon will move around. A random encounter table will create the illusion that NPCs are moving through the dungeon. Think of patrol rules. But if you don't want to bother with patrol rules, and who does, make up random encounter tables, several of them if the dungeon has different sections that have different inhabitants. Lastly, refine, refine, refine. Imagine crawling through the dungeon yourself. How do you find the entrance? Which entrance do you choose and why? What clues does the foreshadowing and layout give you on where to go? Can you make informed decisions? What are choke points that might hold up the PCs for too long or prevent progress altogether? Are alternative routes present? Are hard fights foreshadowed enough? Can they be avoided? Can the party escape? Are traps foreshadowed enough? How hard are they to get around? 
How deadly are they? How hard are the puzzles? Are there ways around the puzzles, should the players be unable to solve them? When does the party reach a safe room to take a rest? And are there routes through the dungeon where you don't find safe rooms? If you want to use the dungeon again after playing through it, or seek to publish it, take notes when you DM your players through it, so you can refine afterward. Yeah, this is my condensed research work of the last few weeks. I'm sure I have not covered many techniques and aspects of dungeon building. Some deliberately, because I thought them less important or that they would make the video too long, and some because I just don't know them. There's a huge variety of dungeons in TTRPG and of ways how you can create dungeons. And if I've missed your favorite ones, please share them in the comments below. For now, I bid thee farewell, dreamers, until we shall meet again.